um, we have lots to talk about. Uh, and as uh, the pattern has been uh, for the past few weeks, today's lecture is sort of an extension, sort of an inspiration for um, all of you, but it might be catered more to the juniors and seniors. Uh, it, it should be interesting, it should be accessible to the ninth and 10th graders. Um, but if uh, the ninth and 10th grade, I mean, if, if you guys, if the younger students are a bit confused about things, don't worry, just sort of uh, enjoy the ride. But juniors and seniors, this should be very relevant to you um, and uh, hopefully enjoyable for everyone. So first of all, does anyone have any questions uh, organizationally or mathematically related? Any questions about the homework? Any questions about the activity that you all did yesterday? And I'll talk more about that. No questions yet. First of all, I should thank you all, 34 of you, for being here because um, that means that there are, you know, <laughs> uh, 66 others who are who are not. And so you all are doing it right. You all are participating. You all are uh, turning in your homework. Um, you're positive. So thanks for your cooperation. Um, we're sort of uh, about to hit the turning point of the course. Uh, today we're gonna to be talking a bit about inflection points, this idea of um, functions uh, changing concavity. And, and it's um, very fitting that we talk about this today because this is indeed a turning point, uh, sort of inflection point of the entire course. We're, we're not quite halfway through, but we're um, rounding an important part. And so after this, things will come a lot more uh, interactive, a lot more engaging. Um, so we've been laying a lot of groundwork, um, but there's lots to look forward to. So, so thanks everyone for being here. So I assume no questions. I'd like to look at this question. This was from yesterday. So generally people did very well on this assignment. Um, so Leanne asked, I forgot to ask the English teacher, but I got my homework emailed yesterday. Do I get, I have no idea. Leanne, I have no earthly idea what the, <laughs> what is going on with the English camp. So you need to email Pratik. I, I wish I, I wish our camps were more cohesive, but you should treat this as like different classes. Like, you know, when you go to school, you have period one, period two, period three. Treat this as last period and treat English as first period. We have, we have nothing to do with each other, <laughs> even though we're, we're good friends. Um, I, I really don't know. Sorry, Leanne. I guess you will have to ask Pratik. Do you have, you have his email? Um, okay, so let's look at this. So someone asked me this yesterday, and, and I actually had a hard time guessing the solutions, even though looking at it now, it's kind of obvious to me. Um, can anyone help me? What, 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 first of all, is this one of our special forms? Is this like one of those cases? One, two, or three? Two. And Danielle, yes, I, I will look at number 14, 15 as well. So first of all, does this fall into any of those cases? Case two, okay, so what was case two? I, I know I've labeled you know, these cases and it's kind of arbitrary. This is not like some general formulation, it's just how I called them. Case two says that when y equals x squared minus two bx plus b squared, that this equals x minus b whole squared. Does this look like this? And then ignore the fact that I've used y instead of x here. In fact, just to be less ambiguous here. Does, does this look like this? And if possible, let's use our, it does look like that. Okay, how about what happened? Um, is there a, do you see a two here? Do you, is there, is there a number out here? It, I see the sign, this, you know, the sign, like you have plus minus plus kind of thing. Yeah, so, so Danielle, I think you're looking at this and you're right that, yeah, the signs match up, but this coefficient is not out here. And so ja this thing cannot be expressed um, as one of these special cases. So I, I could do the same thing with all these cases and, and try to draw similarities, but this is not one of the special cases. This is a more general case, and we're going to have to use our third method that we learned. You could use the quadratic formula, but let's use our third method of guessing the solution. So what are two numbers that multiply to 2i squared? Okay, so what are two? One and two. Shout it out.
two numbers. I mean, it's not hard. This is the easy part. Okay, one, one and two don't multiply to two i squared, but y and two i do multiply to two i squared. So that's, you see what I mean? The, the factors of two i squared have to include y's in them, right? What are two, sorry, two i, sorry. Yes, this is what you meant, right? Y and two i's, because y times two i is two i squared. How about two numbers that multiply to, to 10? Shout it out. Negative, okay, so Monty, yes, that, that is a very clever choice. And should it be negative five and negative two or negative two and negative five? Negative two and negative five. Oh, sorry, sorry, my volume, have people been talking? My volume was turned way down, so I, sorry. Okay, I can, I can hear you now, go, go ahead again, sorry. Negative two and negative five. Thanks, thanks. Sorry, I, I'm like begging people to participate and people might have been talking this time. Negative two, okay, so let's, let's use that choice. And the reason you said that is because this times this, negative five y, right? Added to this times this gives you negative nine. Right, negative, so two y times negative two y gives you negative nine y. Um, so this is the right choice. And then when you multiply across, or you, 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 the way you construct the factors is you basically go across. And so your, oops, your factors are as such. And so now, is this, am I done? Is this it? In no. This, in, in, so in this problem, I am done. Because this is an expression. This is not an equation. What's the difference between an expression and an equation? Anyone? An equation has to equal something. The expression yes. is just the left side of the equation. Yeah, and, and so this this thing does not have this is just basically one side of an equation. This thing does not equal a quantity. So um, because it doesn't equal a quantity, it doesn't have any solution. So I can, I can simplify it, I can factor it, uh, I can write it in many other ways, but I can't make any sense of this because see, this doesn't equal zero, this doesn't equal one, this doesn't equal two. Um, so there are no solutions to expressions. Expressions are just, they're like sentence fragments, you know, like in English class you learn. <laughs> Here's one place where the English class will intersect with the math class. You learn about you know, fragments and incomplete sentences. This is, in a sense, an incomplete sentence, right? So, so we can't make full sense out of this. OK, so th that was a good question. I'm glad people asked. I'm going to look at questions 14 and 15 because someone requested. Um, but I want you all to, how about I do one of them? I'm going to do 14. I don't want to do both. Um, go to the office hours if you want, if you want the other one. Um, in fact, today, uh, Patricia has office hours. I highly recommend. Okay, this is question 14 from the homework. Um, what should I do? First of all, is this case one, two, or three? Yes, no, maybe. Any, does, remember these cases? Yeah, it's none of them. It's none of them. Yeah, I won't, I won't even write. It's none of them because you have this big 100, right? Um, none of these cases included that factor, uh, this coefficient on x squared. So, what what is an approach that I can use? Can I can I think of two numbers that multiply to 100? See how this number is like 10,000 and one? That's a very suggestive number because you know that 100 times 100 is what? 10,000. Yeah, and you know that if, sorry, 10,000, and you know that if you add one to that, you get 10,001. Um, so, so, you know, you can sort of look for these patterns. So, so I, this suggests that a good factorization would be one, so, so x and 100x. And on this side, 101. And the reason I'm doing that is because, look, 100x times 100 is 10,000. Like, but you want it to be negative. But I want, yes, very good. I want both of these to be negative because see this minus sign? So, um, so it, it's sort of a game, and uh, you sort of have to just do a bunch of them and that's the point of the homework, right? So I want you all to get to that point. Um, so I, I won't complete this problem. I mean, it's basically done here, um, but this is the correct factorization. So I think Daniela, you asked, so I hope that helps you. Okay, let's move on to sort of the main topic for today, which is to combine everything we've learned. So, so there's nothing, um, maybe towards the end, yeah, you're welcome, Daniel. Towards the end, um, We'll, we'll hit just a little bit of new material, but today is largely synthesizing uh, 
lots of what we've learned in the entire course. So let's look at this one. Uh, so, okay. Some people like randomly raise their hands. And I think Steve probably just did that. So if you have a question, just shout it out. It's not, it doesn't bother me. Okay, how, how um, is there a way I can do this? So you're giving this on the SAT, which is very possible. How would you do this? Anyone? Factor out of five. Factor out of five. That is a that is a good option. That's a good place to begin. Um, actually, I wouldn't have even honestly thought of that. I, I would have just looked at it. But yeah, let's do that. Why not? Do you agree that I did that correctly? Are you happy with that? I think that was a Ruby you taught me. Yeah. Okay. Um, now what? Can I, can I make sense? Can I graph this? Can I do anything with this yet? No. What, what do I need to do? Anyone? Who, who is, let's see. I haven't heard from, um, I haven't heard from. Would you factor it like you would an expression? It's exactly what I do. Yeah. Because remember when we were talking about uh, inequalities versus equalities and I did that entire thing where I, on the left side I had inequalities and on the right side I had equalities. And I basically said that equalities are specific cases of inequalities. That's so, so we should treat this like an equality and then just slap on this greater than or equal to sign um, at the end. So that's, yeah, so that's exactly what I do. So I can even write it explicitly. I mean, so treat uh, equality. And so I'm going to write this. So this is a different problem, but it's very similar. In fact, it's one, it's, I'm doing the equal to case right now. So five, and how would I factor this? Right. These two numbers multiply to two X squared. How about, how about this number? How about this? Do you agree that this times this plus this times this gives you X? Yes, I assume you can add two and negative one. And so my factors are there. And now I'm just replacing with the inequality. And so how do I deal with this now? What, what does this mean, first of all? Y is greater than or equal to five times two x minus one times x plus one. What, what does this even mean? Well, okay, so what, what is the solution to this? Is it a, a number? Is it a set of numbers? Is it a plane of numbers? Okay, I'm going to call on someone. Um, Can I guess? Like a set of numbers, maybe? It's a set, so, a set, okay, that's basically right. A set of numbers usually means just a set of X. So... Is this, for, for, is this is this a one dimensional or two dimensional problem? Two dimensional. It's two dimensional because you have x and y, so uh, that means you're confined to a plane, not a line. So I should have said a, maybe like a line. Okay, so this is usually one d. So so it's going to be a plane of numbers. How do we determine what that plane is? Well, I think a, a great way is to graph to graph this, and then to use that graph to organize our thoughts. So. How about a graph of this? Well, we've spent all day, I mean, we spent a significant amount of time talking about how to graph these things. And what are the x-intercepts? One, uh -huh. Go ahead. One half and? Negative one. Negative one, good. And how'd you find that? You set this equal to zero, and then you use the zero product property like we did a million times yesterday. And you said that these are the x-intercepts. Very good, what is the y-intercept? And you don't even have to do any work because it's right there. And so Alexis, by the way, asked, do we need to graph things on the homework? No, you don't need to graph things on the homework. Just solve for the zeros. Um, what, 
What is the y-intercept? I get questions knocked off for not graphing. Say that again, what? I, I didn't understand whoever said that, so. Okay, so what is, what's the y-intercept? Negative five. Yes, and so the graph, oh my gosh, this, the graph, ah, sorry, this is hard to, oof. Anyway, sorry for the bad graph. Um, so yeah, my y-intercept is down here. Um, here's one x-intercept, here's the other x-intercept, right, one half, negative one. So this entire thing looks something like this, right? Some parabola that goes through these points. And what is my, what is my sign greater than or equal to? And so which way should I shade? Above or below? Above? Yeah. So all of these points are solutions. So you can see that um, this, uh, this, is a, this is a very interesting shape, actually, because um, it's the shape of telescope mirrors, uh, really great telescopes or parabolic mirrors. And so if you wanted to describe the interior, the plane of a telescope mirror, this, this is exactly what you do, and this is what astronomers do. So yeah, so this entire region, all, all these points, you can pick any point that would satisfy this inequality. Make sense? Okay. How about a system? Remember we talked about systems of linear equations. How about, a, is this a system of linear equations, first of all? And the other one has a degree of freedom. The other one has a different, I didn't quite hear you, but yes, it has a different degree. And what is that degree? That, that degree is two. So this one is nonlinear. Does that mean we can't solve it? I mean, you can you just look for like where they meet? Yeah, yeah, you can very much just look for where they meet. And how would I do that? So first of all, a solution is where the two graphs meet, right? So in two lines, I had this is where they met, and that was the solution. So here I have a line and a parabola, and the place where those two things meet, so here's the line, and the parabola looks like this. How did, how did I know that this is what the parabola looks like? Because I can factor this thing as x plus one times x minus one. This is case three. This is the difference of squares if you're confused as to how I got that. Um, and look, they meet twice. So we know intuitively there should be two solutions, but how do I find these points? You know, if I were a computer, I could graphically like analyze what these points are. If you have a TI-84 calculator, that's what the calculator does. Um, but how would I do it otherwise? How would I not use graphing? Set the factors equal to zero. Set the factors equal, well, first of all, uh, I'm not sure which factors. So that's what I did here. I set this equal to zero, and I found that x is negative one, and x is one. But that corresponds to the zeros of this graph. I want to find where this graph and this graph meet. And oh. what I actually need to do is I need to set them equal to each other. See, both of them equal y, right? So if this one, so basically if I set x minus one equal to x, the solutions to this equation the single equation are the solutions to this system of equations, right? I'm setting the two equal to each other. See, because this equals y, this also equals y. So I'm setting the right-hand sides equal to each other. And you know how to do this. Because now this is, this is a polynomial you should be familiar with. How, how, how do I deal with this? How do I factor this? First of all, one x. Hmm. 
Okay, someone said something, but I'm not sure. First of all, can this be factored? Let's sort of, let's sort of ask the big questions. What is the discriminant here? Remember b squared minus 4ac is the discriminant. b squared is 1. 4ac is 4 times 1 times negative 1. So this is 5, right? So 5 is greater than 0, which means that, yes, there are two solutions that are real. However, notice that these solutions are not numbers that you can guess. So here we're going to have to truly use the quadratic formula. So you, can, you all can look for numbers, I think. You all can, can search the universe for numbers to try to use our method 3 to kind of guess um, solutions here. But I would use the quadratic formula. So A, I'll just write it again. A is 1. B is negative 1. C is negative 1. So applying the quadratic formula, you have the x-intercept is minus B. That's 1. Plus and minus. Square root, B squared minus 4AC. That's what we just found. It's 5 um, over 2A. Over two. So these are your solutions. And I can't really simplify this further because I can't simplify the square root of 5. So they're irrational solutions. And they... They occur, you can, you can see that this one corresponds to 1 plus, sorry, minus 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. And this one corresponds to minus 1 minus square root of 5 over 2. Okay, so those are your solutions. So does this make sense? Does the process make sense? I set the two graphs equal to each other. That's all I did. And those are the solutions to the system. So it's a nonlinear system. It's, it's pretty cool that we can solve a nonlinear system of equations. That's a, it's a branch of math in itself. Make sense? Okay. I don't hear anything from people, so I don't know who is with me. Okay, thanks, Matthew. Okay, it makes sense. How about this? So now I have a system of two linear, two nonlinear equations. This, this one is linear, but this is nonlinear, right? Because it, the degree is two, this is quadratic. And now they're not even equalities, they're inequalities. So truly the best way to do this is by graphing, okay? And, you know, graphing is not, um, graphing is one way to express a solution, but it's not always a very explicit solution, but and that'll be the best we can do here. And so this first graph, we spent all of week one talking about how to graph this. What, what is the y-intercept? Uh, you know, instead of walking you through the graph, I'll just ask you, what does the graph look like of the first one, of one, I'll call it? Um, it looks like a, a, quad, a quadruple. A quadra. Uh, this one is This one is not, because this is a line. So this That's one is of the form mx plus b. Mm -hmm. Right, and so it's not going to have any curvature to it. Um, the the y-intercept is is b, which is negative three. So I know that that's a point on that line, and the slope is two. So I know because the slope is positive, it goes in this direction, and I know that the x-intercept of this line is minus b over m, which is. Oh, I was talking about the second one. You're talking about the second. Okay, hold on to that's, that because we're about to graph the second one. But this is the first one. Okay. Okay. Now you tell me what what how do I go about the second one? Second one. How do I graph this kind of thing? First of all, does is this case one, two, or three? Which one? The second one. Mm -hmm. Just and I'll write the cases again for you. This is case one. This is case two, and this is case sorry. This is case three. Does this look like any of these? Three. Yeah, great. And so three, in case three, we said that this is just this. It's the difference of squares. So yes. given this fact, how would I write this? How would I rewrite the right-hand side like this? Like, like number three? Mm -hmm. How would I apply this, this case to this problem? Well, I know that it's going to be the difference. Look, I'm just... I'm just copying, right? Mm -hmm. This is what we've been given, x squared minus four squared, sorry, my, oh gosh, minus four. And I know that, four, that, that two squared is four. Just as b squared 
um, is b squared here, right? So, so my, my b is two. two. And that's exactly what gets written up here. So what, I keep writing b. Um, so what are my x-intercepts of this? X-intercepts are? I need to set this equal to zero. What, what are they? Yeah. Um, if you don't know. Go ahead, yeah, two and? Negative, negative Very good. Yeah, two and negative two by setting each of these factors equal to zero. So x plus two is zero, x minus two is zero. So that means that x is two and x is minus two. So I know, I'm gonna erase this now, so I have room to graph. So two and negative two. Uh -huh. So two is here, negative two is here. And I know that the y-intercept is negative four. Um, so this uh -huh. is negative three, so negative four is down here. And so this graph looks like this. Sorry, it's not perfect. But you, you can kind of make it out, right? Yes. Okay, great. And so I have a less than sign here. So this one should have been dotted. It should have been a dashed graph, right? So I'm going to yes. erase. Okay. And this, because it's less than, I need to shade below the graph. So it's all of these points, right? And this mm -hmm. one is greater than or equal to. So I, I have a solid parabola signifying the equal to part. And it's above the graph because it's greater than. So I'm going to shade above this graph. And where the two shadings meet, where they overlap, those are my solutions because this is a system and both of them are imposing conditions. So where do they meet? Just in this space here. You see this? Because this is below the line and above the parabola. So this is a very special like shape. It's a very strange shape to model, but we've done it because it's curved on one side and it's straight on the other side. It's pretty cool. Does this make sense to everyone? Sort of how we did this? Yeah. Good, yes. great. Okay. This is an easier problem because it's not a system. It's just a single inequality. And how would it look like? Someone tell me, Let, let's, let's call on people. I haven't done this in a while. Um, is John, I haven't heard from you the entire course. John Perry, are you there? No, uh, I'm just gonna go, uh, let's see, Viviana, are you there? No. Uh, Tanisha. <laughs> okay, I don't know if these people are even there. Um, Tamari? Me? Yes, can you help me with this? How, how would I do this? Thanks for not being shy. <laughs> like everyone else. <laughs> uh, you could graph it. Yeah, I, so I can, I, I can. Um, okay, that, that's an option. How, how would the graph look like? Um, it would be upside down, quadru quadratic. Yeah, great. How do you know it's upside down? Uh, because I, I have a, I graphed it on my calculator. <laughs> oh, great. Um, uh, that's because the oh. x is negative. Yeah. So, so really, what what's going on tomorrow is that you have this negative sign. So remember the parent oh. function. The parent function for quadratics looks like that, and it, it's it's a it's a smiley face kind of thing, right? And when I stick a negative sign on, the entire graph gets reflected across the x-axis because all the y's, right? This is the y-axis. All my y's become negative. See, that's what this negative sign does. It, it takes all the, all the y values and it just flips them. So it'll, it'll look like a mirror image across the x-axis. So that's exactly what this looks like. And how, does, how do we deal with the inequality? It's greater than or equal to. So am I going to shade above or below? Mm, above. Above, great. And the, the parabola is solid because of the equal to sign. So here is your plane of solutions. Okay, makes sense. I just wanted to, we haven't looked at upside down parabolas. We haven't, we haven't done this before. So that's kind of why I, I threw that in there. Okay, now let's incorporate absolute value. Now this is where things become really kind of interesting. Let's see, I'm gonna call on 
Monty, do you know how to do this? You can, I mean, you can say no. I'd rather hear your voice than just hear silence. Uh, let's see, Matthew, do you know how to do this? I can, oh, I can ask to unmute. Okay, Matthew says yes, or he thinks so. Okay, Matthew, can you guide me through this? You would, okay, Monty said, wouldn't you just factor it? Both of, I guess, yes, Monty, you're, you're right. So I would factor the inside, and what would that, so everything's gonna be in, in absolute value bars. And isn't this case one, right? This is, this falls under case one. So how would I factor it? Someone tell me. X plus one and X plus one. Great. And I can even just write X plus one whole squared. That's fine. Okay. So if I were to just, just to graph X plus one whole squared, in fact, I will write it that way. If I were just to graph x plus one whole squared, what would that look like? Where are my x-intercepts? Negative one, and that's my only x-intercept, right? Because negative one, you put this in, that's the only thing that will give you zero on the left-hand side. And what is my y-intercept? One. Great. Uh, so here. And so the graph, I need to fit a parabola to these two points. Okay, so everyone agree? Yes. And now, what do the absolute value bars do? Is, is this graph ever negative? Does this ever go below the y-axis? No. So does the absolute value bar do anything? Because the what does that, I mean, absolute value bar just gives you a positive number from a negative number. So does the absolute value bar even touch this graph? Does it even affect the graph? Not really. It doesn't. In fact, not, not even not really, not at all, right? Because even this point zero, right, where y equals zero, the absolute value of zero is zero. So the absolute value bars literally do nothing. And this makes sense because we know that the square of a number is always positive. So um, whenever you see like something squared and then absolute value bars stuck outside of that thing, um, you can be assured that those absolute value bars don't do anything. How about this case? Okay, first of all, does, does this make sense? So here we have, yeah. this, this is just as good as this. Okay, and we saw that graphically because this thing never goes below the x-axis. Okay, how about this case? See if McCollin's someone else. Uh, Lily, are you there? Yes. Okay, Lily, can thanks for not being shy. Um, how would I go about this? Um, you could take away the threes from the six and the three and the negative three. Okay, great, great. So I'll do that. Oh, sorry. Okay, and now what? Um. Uh, I don't know. Okay, that, no worries. Thanks. That, that's a very good first step. Um, let's see. Uh, Fiona, are you there? Yeah. Okay, Fiona, wh what do I do next? Um, How can I deal with this? Can't I factor this thing? I don't know. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, fifty-fifty, <laughs> right? Either either you can or you can't. Yes. And um, do you, can you suggest how I would do that? What are two numbers that multiply to two x squared? Um, two x and x, right? Two x and x. So so Adi, uh, thanks for posting <laughs> in the chat. But I want I want. Fiona to do this. I want, I want you all to think about this individually. So hold, on, hold off a tiny bit. Okay. Uh, okay. Fiona, what are two numbers that multiply to negative one? One and negative one. Great. And so that's exactly, um, so I'm going to pick negative one and positive one specifically so that two X times one 
one added to two, one added to x minus one, uh, x times minus one, gives me the middle term x. And so my factors are, I'm reading across, two x minus one times x plus one. So good job. So you, you got the right factorization with some help. Um, okay, now what do I do? Someone else. Where, where, can, where can I go from here? Isn't this, this is kind of nice, right? Because I can sort of start graphing. So um, I'll, I'll sort of finish this, okay? Um, how would the graph look? Oh, these lines are just not good. Um, okay, well, I know the x-intercept of this thing would be one half and negative one, as Adi said a while ago. So these are my x-intercepts, right? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna plop them down here. Negative one, one half, okay? And um, the y-intercept would be uh, negative one. So, so if people are about to start yelling at me for something, just hold on, okay? <laughs> the y-intercept I think would be negative three. So this would be, what I've just graphed here is just this inside part. You see that this is just, uh, I'll, I'll use colors. So what I just graphed is this. Okay, now I'm gonna do some, now I'm going to apply the absolute value bars. So the absolute value bars take all my negative y, all my negative y values, which are down here, and they make them positive. That's the, the definition of absolute value. It, it converts negative to positive. Um, isn't the y-intercept plus one? It's not plus one um, because I'm not talking about this yet. I'm, I'm building up to that point long. Um, so yes, so we're gonna show that the y-intercept the y of this eventual graph is four, but I'm sort of building this up from scratch. So I, I'm starting with this. So this is not the final graph. I'm about to apply the absolute value bars. And what that does is it reflects just this negative part across the x-axis, like a mirror. So now my graph looks like this. So there are these spikes here. You see these spikes? Ouch, you know, sharp points, kind of. Okay, now I'm gonna multiply this all by three. So the three just scales everything up. Okay, so now I'm gonna use a different color. So what does this three do? This three just stretches the graph by a factor of three. So this used to be the point, um, this used to be the point negative one, now it's one, and now it's gonna get stretched out to three. So this entire graph is gonna look like this, and then okay, this is a horrible drawing. I'm not, I'm not gonna draw it on this yet. But you can see, right, uh, how the entire, oh man, this is bad. <laughs> okay, well the graph got stretched out by this three. And now what does, this plus one, this plus one just shifts everything that I now have. I'll use the rainbow pen. It's not working. The plus one shifts everything I have up a unit. So all of this, so this point's gonna get shifted up here. The three is gonna get shifted up to four. Uh, this point's gonna get shifted up here. So the eventual graph is like this. Sorry, it's, it's hard to see. Um, okay, did you people sort of see how I did that? We take, oh, my W's wrong. nice. Okay, yeah, it kind of does look like a W. Okay, so kind of an interesting shape, yeah? So you, I, I built it up piece by piece. I wish I could do this on a true whiteboard in front of you all because I'm much better at drawing on, on a whiteboard than um, on this. Okay, great. So, so we've gotten some nice exposure. We've combined everything we've learned um, in the course so far, absolute value and inequalities. We haven't used dimensional analysis in this discussion, but we've, we've talked about a lot of things at once. Um, so I hope this is satisfying to many people. I do want to just cover some fine points. Um, and these are brief, and then I'll, I'll, yes, there is a quiz today, so these are very brief points, uh, but you definitely need to know them. So if you have notes with you, if you have a notepad, write this down. The vertex, of, what is the vertex of a parabola? Like a, like a center point? The center. Like any, or any, like, point here, like, any end point. Yeah, so here, Adi, I'm just going to draw some curve. Where's the vertex? Right. <laughs> like pointing to, yeah, it's, it's either the highest point or the lowest point of a parabola. And 
um, it, it's uh, sort of, in a sense, the most important point of a parabola. Because if you can imagine a ball in a hill, okay, or in a valley, in this case, a valley, say you let go of it, it'll go down and it'll go up. And if there's friction, it'll keep going like this, like this, like this, until it lands at the vertex. So the vertex is a physically meaningful point and mathematically as well, because you can see that it's the minimum or maximum of a parabola. And for the seniors who are taking calculus, you will find, uh, okay, so this is a bit, uh, ninth and 10th graders, you don't have to worry as much. Okay, but I'm gonna write the general form of this. This is our general, you know, um, Quadrat uh, quadratic equation, right? X squared plus B plus C. And I know that, um, okay, so uh, I don't know. I, okay, seniors, you haven't taken calculus, but when you take calculus, you'll find a way, a general way to find the minima and maxima of any function. And um, you'll find that if you differentiate this thing, okay, um, so you'll learn about this thing called differentiation, and I'm not going to do it because I don't want to confuse people. But you'll find that the minimum or the maximum of a parabola happens at the point x is minus b over 2a. So, so first of all, do, do any of the seniors want me to do the calculus? It's like a one-line thing of calculus. Yes. You would want me. Okay, so ninth and 10th graders truly do not worry about what I'm about to write. This is This is not uh, even remotely, th this is just uh, enjoy the ride, okay? So, so seniors, um, there's this thing called differentiation. And basically it's the instantaneous slope of a graph. So we talked about y equals mx plus b and how the slope is m, right? Um, well, that is a constant for a line. But it turns out for a parabola, the slope, so to speak, changes at every instant. Right? because it's a curved thing. So the slope here is different than the slope here, which is different from the slope here. And so if I differentiate this thing, I'll, I'll tell you the, the derivative of y. And you write that as dy over dx. Okay, um, So don't let this bother you if, if this doesn't make sense. This is really not important. The derivative of this thing is this. Okay, And it turns out that when the derivative is equal to 0, well, the derivative is really the same thing as the slope. This is instantaneous slope you can think of. And when the derivative is equal to zero, well, that's the point we're interested in because here the slope is zero, see? So I'm gonna set this thing equal to zero. And solving for x, I would have minus b over 2a. So that's sort of the calculus. So, so this, I feel like a lot of people learn this in like seventh and eighth grade, um, but the, the derivation is, is in calculus. So this is the vertex of any parabola, okay? So write that down. Um, and uh, if you're given any, so let's take, Let's take this as an example, as a quick example. What, where is the vertex of this parabola using this fact? Someone tell me, just plugging in numbers. Here. Negative one. Yeah, and so the way, yeah, very good. And the way I do that is I'd say, look, B is two, A is one, and C is one. And there's no C, so I don't even need C. There's no C in this uh, derivation here. Um, so the vertex, I can really call this like xv because it's a specific point x, and it's going to be negative 2, negative b, over 2a, which is 2. So negative 1. Yeah, and that's your vertex. And indeed, if you were to plot this, you would find that this looks like that, and this is the point negative 1, which also happens to be a 0, a solution. Okay, so that's just a, uh, yeah, you, you just did that at the end of this year. Very good. So I'm glad this is helpful. So for the juniors and seniors, I hope this is motivating for your study of calculus. You can see how powerful calculus is, okay? okay. One last thing, um, this idea of concavity, okay? Um, concavity refers to the curvature of a graph. So I'll, I'll just draw some examples. This thing is part of a parabola. It is curved upwards. You can see that um, even though the direction of the graph changes, right, from here to here to here to here, it, the entire thing is, is curved like a bowl. It's all curved in one direction. And the way to test whether the concavity is the same or different across a graph is to draw little tangent lines. So if I zoom in, 
see, I, I can draw these little lines. See, lines, lines, lines. So these little lines, I'll use a different color so you can see better. These little lines, do they lie above or below the graph? Someone tell me. Below the graph? Below the graph. And as long as they always lie below the graph, this thing is concave up. And I'll use another example to show you concave down. Okay. I'm going to draw tangent lines. Look. Tangent line, tangent line, tangent. A tangent line is just a line that touches the graph at one point only. See? Are these above or below? Above. Oh, all of these lines are above. And so this thing is entirely concave down. But can't the concavity change? And indeed, we'll see that the, the concavity can, for example, in this graph. Here, my, my tangent lines are above. And look what happens. Look, I keep drawing tangent lines. And now look, what happened? Somewhere around here, it went from above to below. Yeah? Does that make sense? Just, just visually, right? Yeah. So this is called an inflection point. And quadratics, like these, these kinds of graphs, these all look like quadratics. Quadratics do not have any inflection points. Okay. But higher order polynomials, and this is all we're going to talk about this, we're not going to talk about factor in higher order polynomials, that's on the SAT, but higher order polynomials do have uh, inflection points. And um, specifically, the number of inflection points is the, num is the degree of the polynomial. And remember, the degree is like the highest exponent on x minus 2. Okay, so let's, for example, the degree of a quadratic is 2. And when I subtract 2, I get 0. Therefore, quadratics have no inflection points. Um, cubics, however, of degree 3, what is 3 minus 2? Well, 1. And they indeed have one inflection point. And um, here was an example. I was going to do this if we had time, but we don't. This is a cubic polynomial. I was going to show you the solutions and stuff. But in short, the, the cubic polynomial looks something like this. Oops, sorry, I'll do that in graph. It looks something like that. And there is an indeed like an inflection point right here. There's one inflection point. And that was sort of what I showed more explicitly with these tangent lines. How about a quartic polynomial? That is of degree four. Um, and so four minus two is what? Two. Two, right? So yeah, so a quartic polynomial will have generally two inflection points. Um, a quartic polynomial looks like a quadratic in that it is headed upwards. And generally, even polynomials, and when I say this, I mean things that go like x to the sixth, x to the fourth, x squared, um, and even technically x to the zero, which is a constant. Um, but any of these even exponents, if this is the highest um, term, right, the highest degree, these things look like this. They, they have their arms, they're like smiley faces or frowny faces. In other words, when you go to large or, and very small, like in, you know, when you go to infinity in either direction, your graph approaches uh, either plus or minus infinity. But if you have odd, odd degree polynomials like x, x cubed, x to the fifth, x to the seventh, these have arms in, going in opposite directions. So as you go to plus infinity, this one goes to plus infinity. And as you go to minus infinity, this one goes to minus infinity. So they, they go in opposite directions. Um, so this is just a fine point, OK? Um, generally, I want you to know, and you know, need to know this for your quiz, we talked about linear functions. We talked about quadratics. We just briefly talked about cubics and how they look and how they have one inflection point. And there are even these things called quartics. And I showed you, I, I, well, at least I, took, um, I guess, from my word that quartics look like quadratics, roughly. They kind of are more flat towards the bottom, but they, they generally have the same shape. And it turns out that there are no general solutions. So for, okay, there are no solutions to polynomials greater than quartic polynomials. For, for example, quintic polynomials, no general solution. Um, six degree polynomials, no solution. Seven degree. Okay, so so do you do you um, 
you're long said his third grade class has not gotten here yet. Okay. Remember the solution to this, what is the x intercept? Minus b over m. Here, the solution to this is the quadratic formula minus b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac over 2a. There is also a, a general expression for the solution of a cubic polynomial. I don't know it off the top of my head, but it's uglier because remember how much more non-trivial this result was than this result. So generally there's this trend of you know, things getting a lot harder, a lot harder, a lot harder. And it turns out there is also a general solution to the quartic polynomial, but there's no general solution to the quintic and beyond. <laughs> okay, people are, are writing funny comments in there. Okay, I'm going to send out the quiz. Um, does anyone have any questions about anything we covered today? I know the end was a bit rushed, a bit more scattered, uh, but there's the quiz. Um, I'll stick around if people have questions. Homework is due tomorrow. I forgot that there was like a reading Zoom this week. Was there one? I think there was. I re again, I don't know what's going on. I thought it was the it, it's on Monday, Wednesday. Oh. Yeah, it's not today. Thanks, Audie. You, you all know more about it than I do. Okay, so when you're, once you're done with the quiz, you're free to go.